So maybe you could just start. Uh, basically, I'll, I'll start with, uh, I quit painting around 72. I was just sort of banging my head against a wall. And so I threw away, buried, and destroyed almost all my paintings. I think I have one or two left stuffed away in storage. And then I started with the influence of Ava Hess, Bruce Nauman, and Vito Acconci, Chris Burton, and the Viennese group, Herman Nietzsche, and Joseph Boyce, all these people. And I started reading Avalanche magazine around 72. And so I was influenced by all these things. And I started experimenting with materials. So that's where I made this sculpture here is foam rubber and nylon stockings that were given to me by an ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and uh, I call it rat dog. And it was made around 72, 73. And I've still, I've used it over and over in various uh, performances and installations. And so that's, this is called the Foam Rubber House. Uh, it's an installation that I did at this uh, temporary uh, artist space. In the 70s, you know, they didn't really have galleries that an artist could show at unless you were a blue chip artist. And so there were like all these alternative art spaces. And that's what that was on Venice Beach. And so I paid uh, $25 a month for this space. And I just did shows there. And so that's what that is. It's foam rubber and, and uh, cotton and, and uh, into chicken wire. It's been stapled to the walls. So why don't you continue? That's me with lots of hair on Venice Beach. And that was like three or four months later. And Actually, and that's in 74, actually. Uh, that's the wrong date on that. But uh, I was doing performances. I began doing performances there where I would just sit there and, and smile at people and grin. And that was my performance. They were, they were called lectures. And so people would come by, the street people, and just come and look at me and take photographs and grin back. And on top there, there's the various foam rubber sculptures that I was making at the time. And some of these sculptures you see here, You'll see later on that I, I covered them with, because uh, foam rubber doesn't last very long. So I covered it with uh, acrylic paint and ink and made them into another kind of sculpture. I do that a lot, actually, where I, I'll take something that I've worked on before, like in the 60s or 70s, and then continue working on it. And uh, it's sort of it's transformation. OK, go on. So this is me, again, in 1974 sort of trying to figure out what to do as a performance. So I was just sort of dancing around, and my girlfriend at the time just took various photographs of me dancing around in my sculpture. So you could see that's the windows pointing out to the boardwalk. And I it's a process, so I cut, cut one of the walls off. And so like in the other photograph, where it's all covered, and it was just like a little hole to get into that space. And here it's all it's opened up. So those windows, the sort of shelf goes from those windows to a small window to the right, to the left. OK, go on. There you can see the board rock a little more clear. I'm still just dancing around. Didn't really know what to do, so that's all I did. But also, at this later on, I took this photograph from 73 or 74 and blew it up and then painted over it. So in 2002, I turned it into something else. So that's what all the, the acrylic, that's white acrylic paint mostly and in ink that I added on to my body. OK, continue. This is the same thing. It's one of the sculptures that I made in the early 70s. Uh, and then I just, uh, my girlfriend at the time took photographs of me. And then later on in 2002, I painted over it and drew over it. So it became something else. Went from you know, 20 years or more and just transformed a little bit. OK, continue. This is Rat Dog again. Uh, another friend of mine took photographs of me in his apartment with this sculpture. And then again, later on, 2007, I painted over it with other kinds of rats. OK, continue. This is the first regular performance that I did for this uh, Neo Dada gallery in LA uh, called Armut. 
So that was October 1975, and I just went to this, it was called Mount Pinos, and sort of hung around with these uh, bird watchers up there and for 12 hours. At that point, I was much younger, so I was doing these, they were all 12-hour performances, so they're usually from sunrise to sunset. So that's what I did there. And the beer bottles on the sticks are actually from another artist that was part of the gallery, it was part of this show outside. And her name was uh, Tinkerbell, and she tied these beer bottles to these poles. And so when the wind would come through, it would make this sort of hooting sound, which is kind of nice, very nice. Huh. Mm -hmm. And you can see the beer uh, boxes back there. Okay, continue. This is the second part of the Wilshire Boulevard Walk, which is the more one, another one of the more formal performances I did. It was uh, sponsored by CARP, which is a at that time was an alternative art space that they did stuff with Chris Burden, Bruce Nauman, uh, a lot of Alexis Smith, a lot of uh, pretty well-known artists. And so I was very happy to be asked to do a piece with them. And so I suggested walking the entire length of Wilshire Boulevard from, uh, at first I just wanted to do it at night, but they said, no, nobody would see it. So I did it twice. I did it on my birthday, January 28, 1976. And then a week later, I did it uh, at night, so the one, the first one was from sunrise to sunset. And I started in downtown LA, and I walked the 18 miles to the beach at Santa Monica. I don't know if anybody knows LA, but it's Wilshire Boulevard because sort of goes through the heart of LA. It's like this major artery. And so a week later, I, I did this through the night, and uh, the night one was actually very quiet, and uh, the day one. I stopped to rest in front of this bank in Beverly Hills, and suddenly I was surrounded by five cop cars. Um, <laughs> at that time, you know, I had very long hair, and I looked like a combination of uh, Jesus Christ and Charles Manson. So uh, <laughs> it wasn't very, you know, I was standing there stretched with mud on me in here, and so they were kind of like, okay, this is good. And so I gave, I had a little card saying I was an artist, and it was a show, and so they just looked at it, and they just said, just keep walking, just keep walking, so. It was fine. Uh, and it actually was fairly easy because 18 miles in 12 hours, it's like a few miles, you know, an hour. And it's just like a steady walk. The only thing was the structure digging into my shoulders, but um, it was fine. And also, I couldn't go into any place to, to pee or anything. So I remember during the day, I was walking and I, I had to pee around La Cienega and there was a gas station there so I walked in to try to use the, you know, the outdoor gas station to pee and the gas station attendant just sort of looked at me and said, no, 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 forget it. And so I, as I was walking I had to like just pee in my pants so I had, you know, pee running down my leg through okay. the mud. But, uh, you know, it was part of the performance so it's all, you know. Okay, go on. This is the week before, January 28th, at Wilshire Boulevard. So I, I carried my clothes with me in a little bucket of the mud. And, uh, okay, go on. Much, this is in 78 uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, in 78 is when I met Paul McCarthy and uh, Barbara Smith and Linda Montana and all these artists, performance art group in LA, and that's when High Performance Magazine started up. And uh, Barbara Smith was, she's an excellent person. She, she actually, she helped out Chris Burden at F Space. She was, you know, one of the people there with uh, Nancy Buchanan. And uh, so she's the one that actually asked me to do a performance at uh, Leica. It's another space in LA and sort of brought me into that fold, I think, and introduced me to the high performance people. And uh, so that's where I began to know a lot of the performance people. And so that's when I did this, uh, where I climbed various telephone poles in LA. And a friend of mine, that's probably the, one of the better photographs of any of my performances by a really good friend of mine, Ned Sloan. Okay, go on. This is in Venice Beach. Uh, again, this is a point where I I lived there, so I was, I was kind of like one of the characters on Venice Beach, I guess, in a certain way. 
I, mean, I looked very scary, but it actually, you know, wasn't tough at all. I was just kind of like a little sort of a wimp, but I just looked kind of strange to people, so they accepted me. I mean, I, many of my friends were, you know, actually really kind of scary, basically criminal types. I mean, I had a, a friend that, I mean, his job basically, he went to Hollywood and he robbed people with his gang you know, until somebody shot him in the leg. Um, but, uh, you know, but I think they liked me just because I looked like a drug dealer. I just looked weird. So, so for them to see me walking around with sticks and mud, it's kind of like, oh, that's just Kim. He's just, you know, that's. So it was the easiest place for me to do performance at that point. And then I branched out from there to LA and San Francisco and Chicago and then New York. And um, so that's sort of how it sort of grew out of some place that I was comfortable with, people that I was comfortable with. And so, you know, and actually eventually I became comfortable with the people in, uh, in New York, you know, and mostly in, in Soho, but also in the East Village and uh, Chinatown, different places that I lived. Okay, continue. This is in Hollywood. Actually, I, the only thing is there's like a few people that were looking at me doing this. Again, my friend, uh, Ned Sloan, took these photographs. It was this vacant lot that they were doing constructions on, and uh, I remember this old man was walking his dog and he came by and he said, uh, I should call the police on you. And I said, what, go ahead. And sort of walked away, kind of nervous, I'm like, oh, okay. But uh, we didn't do anything, we just you know, took photographs and sang. Okay, continue. This is a performance I did in 83. I'm also a Vietnam vet. I was in uh, Vietnam in 67, 68 in the US Marines. And so I did this piece where I walked from the WPA, which is an alternative art space in Washington, D.C., to the Vietnam Memorial. So this is part of that walk. And actually on that walk, I remember I was walking, I walked by the White House. And as I was walking by, the reporter ran up to me and he said, are you trying to get arrested? And I said, no, no, I'm just walking. And he said, no. Oh. And he was kind of like, he wanted me to get arrested, I guess, or something. And I remember I walked by a cop car and they just sort of looked at me and said, oh, yeah, we know him. So they already knew who I was, they didn't care. So go on. That's the Vietnam Memorial. I left, I built that structure on my back there. And I left the structure on my back at the Vietnam Memorial. Okay, continue. This is uh, the, the attic at uh, PS1, which is now part of MoMA. And they invited a whole bunch of artists to do installations there. So I sort of made so the couch and the chair was already there, and there was little bits of furniture, so I covered it with these, I call these stars, these just very simple sculptures that are made with just uh, sticks that I found in the parks, and I tied them together with electrical tape. Some of the more complex ones I'll paint on the inside. So they look kind of like sea animals or, or, uh, or mines or some sort of, uh, traps for tanks or they look like a lot of things and so it's like they were invaded it's like mud man's apartment and so <laughs> uh, that's what that was and that was up for actually two or three years that installation and they they had tours where they'd take people up through there and there was a path that was worn where people would just walk through almost like disneyland i suppose going on a art ride Okay, continue. This is at the Mattress Factory, another great place in Pittsburgh. They invited me there and I, again, I stars and I obsessed with rats, so I drew or painted rats on the walls and made it another installation and did a few performances there. Okay, go on. This is one of the sculptures that I've used off and on. Most of the sculptures, the back sculpture, structures have been, I call them structures, They've been destroyed. There's there's two that are still in existence. This one and the other one that you saw, the first photographs. Okay, go on. This is me doing performance when I was living in the East Village. It's around Second Avenue. Okay, go on. This is in a gallery in Soho, uh, Lawrence Monk Gallery, where I had a show. I used to, for a lot of my shows, I'd do a performance for the show, but I, 
I don't do that many performances anymore. I did one a couple of years ago for Barbara Gladstone Gallery in uh, Chelsea at a group show. I did it twice. And, uh, you know, I was, I guess, 68, 69 then. And, you know, I hadn't put the structure on my back in many, many years. And I realized the structure is just as heavy, but I'm much weaker and older and was like, what the fuck am I doing this again? <laughs> but I did it, you know, and it's like, okay. And so, it's fine. Go on. This is a place called Mount, uh, no, this is uh, Furkapas. It's in Switzerland. It's about 8,000 feet up near the Rhone Glacier. Uh, and these, they invited me up there to do an installation. A lot of Lawrence Wiener, uh, a lot of artists, it's a hotel. If they invite artists there to stay for a couple months and make an art piece, and uh, so I had to, I had a buckets and a wheelbarrow that I built this. All those stones I put there myself. It took me about a month or so to do that, and uh, then I made a structure and did some performances. And after the performance, I burned the structure there. So I built those stars there and. I came back a year later and they'd all blown down the hill because of the snow and all that. Okay, go on. This is a photograph from a performance I did at uh, the New Museum when it was on Broadway in February. I used to, you know, it's like I, the cold didn't bother me that much. It was very, very cold and I did these mud man performances in front of the museum. So I was just standing there. I remember thinking, again, what the hell am I doing here? Mm. But you know, I did it. And uh, so years later, in 2007, I painted over it. So I made myself a little girlfriend in the back. And, uh, you know, sort of extended sculpture. OK, go on. This is, uh, again, 86. Uh, I just did this once where I came down to the subway and uh, just took photographs. There's lots of photographs of this. And, uh, couldn't do it now. They'd arrest you immediately. They'd probably shoot me if they saw me now. Yeah. You know. Okay, continue. So this is me. This is a New Yorker ignoring me. So years later, again in 2002, I painted over it. I've done this a lot where I've taken my photographs and other people's photographs or, or ads too and I just blow them up and then paint over them, <coughs> sort of give them a second or third life. Okay, continue. This is again in the subway, and this is, I've done some other drawings too about St. Sebastian, so this is kind of me as St. Sebastian in the subway. Mm. And you can see it's typical New Yorkers are refusing to acknowledge, it's like, no, this isn't happening. Okay, go on. This is from the show at the Lawrence Monk Gallery. And then I again, 2007, I painted over it, gave myself a little rat tail. Can I continue? This is actually, if you think back to the first, some of the first uh, photographs, those sculptures, sort of bulbous shaped things, are from the sculptures that are made in 72, 73. And they've been painted over with many, many layers of acrylic paint and ink. And that sort of preserved the uh, foam rubber and nylon, because you know, a lot the stuff that I had that I didn't paint over it just it turns to dust. You know, it's foam rubber, and uh, so that's again giving a new life to a lot of these sculptures from the 70s. And that's just a graphite on the wall, so it looks like it's racing around the gallery. Go on. This is a shirt that I think my sister gave it to me for Christmas, but I've drawn over a lot of shirts that I got tired of wearing. And uh, it's a, I call these war drawings. They're, it's, a, it's a game that I started playing when I was a child with pencil and uh, eraser on little sheets of paper. And I still have some from 58, 59 that I saved. Uh, a collector actually has them. Uh, and it's, it's a two-dimensional game between X's and dots the X's have black, tank, black tanks and the dots, dots have white tanks. And uh, they're always fighting each other. 
and uh, they live, the outside world is a maze or a labyrinth, and each one has a city, and there's water, and there's super tanks and regular tanks, and they, I have pencils that show the range for the various tanks, and when they die, they're erased, or when they move them, like I'll draw like maybe 10 black tanks, and then I erase it, and I redraw them, and so they, that's how they move across the, the two-dimensional space. And so after, you know, now I do these on very large sheets of paper, and so after a few years, you know, it begins to actually look like a beautiful, like a Twombly drawing almost, or, or something like that. Uh, but it's, these, this is ink, but the ones in pencil, I did for, for years, I didn't really think of them as art. There was like, I did my regular art, but I did these in sort of secret. And then I started showing them at a commercial gallery, Lawrence Monk, in 1990. And they started selling. And so it's basically money. And I said, oh, these are selling, so I may as well keep them. And I know it sounds simplistic, but that's pretty much the way I was thinking. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's a form of conceptual art, I think, the war drawings. It's, it's, uh, it's continuously changing. So that they're, never, they're never really finished. It's not about composition. I don't really think about the way with regular painting or drawing, you think about how things relate to the, to the page. And this is more about detail, about being very clear about where a black tank or a white tank is and where their supplies are and where they live and how they move through the page. And uh, so it's like a whole different mindset for me when I do these pieces. And. Uh, the thing with the ink is it's, it's different. It's a slightly slower process, but it's the same sort of idea. Uh, it's being very clear about where things are. And I, instead of erasing, I take a brush and I paint it over with white paint, and then I move them around that way. And when you erase on the paper, though, it leaves a ghost image. So there's all these smuds, these ghost images of things that were moved around or killed. And the thing is, I'm on both sides at the same time, so I always win and I always lose. <laughs> and so I'm kind of like, I try to explain it like I'm a minor god, which is sort of standing over this, and it's very cynical, but it's like a god that doesn't really care one way or another. You know, it's kind of like, well, it's their turn. It's this guy's turn to die, and this one's turn to live, and you know, that's the way it is. And uh, usually when I talk to students, I, I talk about, there's a, a great book that I read years ago called Flatland by, a 19th century mathematician, Abbott. And it's about a world that's two-dimensional, that's inhabited by squares and triangles and circles. And the more sides you get, the higher up you go in the society. And eventually they discover the third dimension. But uh, it's, it's a great book, very, it's easy to read, and it's really, it's a fantastic book to read. Very short, but you know, it's very, it's difficult, especially for students, I think, to understand the whole idea of flatness, of two-dimensionality, you know, and so I, you know, can use that to just describe that. So that's partly what the history of this is like, you know, something that's part of me, that is, it's like me carrying my history or a war drawing on my back, basically. Okay, continue. This is the, one of my shirts I came out of the Marines as a corporal, and so here I am in 2005. I was in the Marines from 66 to 69, so it's a pretty old shirt, but Marines make very, very tough material. So I made a war drawing on the back of that. It belongs to somebody now. Okay, continue. Another one of my jackets that became an art piece. Okay, continue. Here you can barely see, this is the pencil one. This was in the Venice Biennial, and it took me two months to be there. And uh, the drawing behind me is, it's on uh, like a tarp. So it's graphite on a tarp, and they sort of glued that to the wall, and they hung that jacket, and then I drew around the one on the wall, and it took me two months to make another war drawing around that and continue it. It was a pretty good deal because actually when the curator asked me to do the piece in Venice, I said, well, it'll take me two months to do it. And so they found me an apartment in Venice for two months for mm -hmm. free and paid for food and everything. So it's like, wow, well, I'm going to do this more often. <laughs> uh, so, you know, every day I just go and walk by the canal and have my cappuccino and then go to work. 
great. Uh, so, and then that's all destroyed afterwards, except somebody bought the jacket and the, the drawing on the tarp, but all the rest on the wall was destroyed, which is what usually happens. Uh, I've done that where I've drawn on walls, you know, in Sydney, in Ireland, and uh, a lot of, in Texas, at Art Pace. I've done a lot of that. And that's also part of the whole process, like a form of process where it only has a certain amount of life, and then it's gone. It's the way it is, unfortunately, for us. It's like we're here and then we're not here. That's it, boys and girls. Okay, go on. This is one of my drawings. I, there's the date on here, but this is actually a drawing from the 70s that I drew over again in 2002 or three. And so uh, that's a, like early 70s, I was sort of really out of touch with a lot of California art, like the cool art. I was more influenced by, you know, the Renaissance, maybe even Degas, you know, Delacroix, Ang, you know. And I was just very, very uncool to all the people in LA that were doing, you know, just surfboard looking art. It's great art. I've gone come to appreciate it very much, but still, you know, it was like not cool to them. And so but I just continued doing it even though my teachers hated me for it. But, and so I took a lot of these drawings and later on drew over them. They were good enough that I didn't want to destroy them, but not good enough to show them. And then after I drew over them, I was able to show them and I, I liked them a lot better. So this is that process. Okay, continue. This is another example of a photograph of performance I did this friend of mine's apartment in Venice. And then years later, I drew over it. I'm not sure where these spaces come from. They're, they're, they're kind of just people I've met or combinations of people I've met. So be careful, you may end up in one of my drawings someday. Mm -hmm. But uh, and behind me, that I st still have that foam rubber sculpture. It's foam rubber and uh, that's uh, chicken wire or aviary wire and uh, screening that I cut up, made into like a sort of Picasso-like sculpture. Okay, go on. It's a performance I did with uh, Paul McCarthy and uh, uh, John Duncan at this very strange hotel in downtown LA. Uh, and then I, later on I drew over it again. But uh, actually after I was finished with this performance, this is 86, but there was like a, a lot of sort of punk crazy people in the audience. And after the performance, this punk kid came up to me and uh, he's like a really handsome kid. He looked like a, like a French poet or something like that. He just, you know, that kind of look. And he just said, I really like your performance. And I said, well, thank you. And he said, and he pulled out a large chunk of his hair and gave it to me. And, and I heard thinking, Wow, that's pretty serious. Thank you. And I, I put, I have it in a jar actually at home, and uh, so I gave him the sculpture that I was wearing on my back at that point. So I, later I found out he was dying of cancer, so that's why it was easy for him to pull a chunk of hair out of his head. But like, man, that's pretty <laughs> devoted to art. Yeah, and so uh, I don't know what happened to him, but I gave him my sculpture, and that was it. Okay, continue. This is another example of photos. These were found photographs. I guess it must have been like 82, 83 when I found these on the street in 6th Avenue in New York. And I started painting over them and uh, continued painting over them. And so that's the only thing that's left is, I guess you can see like a little hand in the middle and maybe a, a shadow and a little bit of a boot. But I was just very lucky, because I showed these where a lot more of the models showed up, and I was lucky that the models never saw these, because I think I could probably get in trouble. I think Richard Prince got in a lot of trouble. Even the photographer never saw it. It's like, it's a problem. You know, you get sued. It's like, it's, it's their photograph, even though I found it on the street in the trash. But, you know. So, but it's been painted over. It's mine now. So. Continue. Here you can just see a, a shoe at the very bottom. 
that's all that's left of the photograph. Again, that, that, so that photograph actually had, had been, I painted over it several times until I got to the point in 2007 where I liked it. But I, I, so I remember showing it a year later. I was in the Venice, or the, uh, the Paris Biennial in 85, and I showed these photographs as part of an installation. And it's sort of a, and they've gone through many, many changes. Okay, continue. <coughs> this is also using my Janus art history book. These are drawings by Watteau that I glued onto this paper and then added my own version. Okay, continue. Now there's Rat Dog again, and there's some of these sculptures are from the 70s. I painted over, and at the one corner you could see this dollhouse, which I was talking about with some other people later on earlier. That's dollhouse that I made for my mother in '74. Yeah. It's difficult to explain, but uh, that's just where I filled it full of black rubber rats. But it's gone. It'll be in the next show in '80 in May the second. And it's gone through many changes since then. I took the rats out and redid it. So it's another, another version of it. Okay, continue. It's another show, actually. Those are just wigs that I painted over. And the inspiration for those came actually from the American Indian Museum in 85. It used to be uptown on 155th Street. And they used to have scalps there. Uh, Blonde scalps, all kinds of scalps. I don't, I'm not sure if they can show them anymore. I think things have gotten a little more strict about it, but I remember being fascinated by the scalps. So these wigs I painted on the inside, and they look, it looks almost like brains or scalps or something, and I call them mops. And so I made a whole bunch of those and I showed them. And the, the very back is a doll sculpture that's been destroyed since then. Okay, continue. You can see a sort of slightly closer view of the mops. Okay, continue. The drawing in the middle, it's, it's too bad. I, I, there's not a close up of that. It's, it's uh, three objects in the, in the middle of that, in the middle drawing, are cartoons that I made when I was 13 or 14. And I found them in a box and cut them up and glued them onto an illustration board and then drew around them. So it's like myself at 13 or 14 and then myself in my 50s or 60s. So I used two versions of myself. Okay, continue. So I think this is the sh installation at uh, the University of Buffalo. Again, another example of various structures that you already saw. Uh, and the stars in the middle of them, there's the rats, you can barely see them. Okay, continue. That's the, the original st structure that, which has been cut in half and remade several times. Actually for a show in Chicago in 1980, I think I cut it in half and then twice going from L.A. to Chicago and back. And then when I moved to New York, I cut it in half again. And so it's gone through a lot of change, but it's, that is the original sculpture that you saw with the Wilshire Walk. And that's the, the hat that I wear on the chair there. Okay, continue. The same show, the star shapes. Okay, continue. And that's it. Okay, if you have any questions, um, you know, you're welcome.